evening, everyone. I am uh, James Horvath and your 2021 president for the AIA Las Vegas chapter. I'm excited to welcome everyone here tonight. This is our third member meeting of the year already. We're very excited. Uh, this month, we have a presentation that's being put on together with our Women in Architecture Committee for AIA Las Vegas. Before I get into the introductions of the committee chairs, I'd like to first say thank you to our evening sponsors. Tonight is brought to us uh, to our membership through the sponsorship of our visionary sponsors. Uh, they are NIT Studios, Nevada Sales Agency, the Penta Building Group, and Clyde Juba Wald. Also, uh, this is also being brought to us by our platinum sponsors, who is Harris Consulting Engineers, TJK Consulting Engineers, Bergman Walls and Associates, and Grand Canyon Development Partners. Tonight, the Women in Architecture Committee's purpose is to recognize and raise awareness of gender equality in the profession and to engage members through the education and social programs. I also wanna make a point to say that this committee is not just for women, um, but is invited for all members to participate in. Uh, the committee chairs uh, for this committee are two individuals, Monica Gresser and Anna Peltier, as well as our secretary who is, uh, she dropped off, Alexia Chen, um, but she is also here with us tonight. At this time, I'd like to introduce and turn the presentation over to Monica Gresser. Hi, thanks, James. Hello, everyone, welcome. Um, last night, I was reminded that I first met Monica Chada at the 2014 Association for Community Design National Conference at the University of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, oh, not Michigan, Detroit Mercy. Um, and that's where she'd been working with the university um, with Impact Detroit and uh, Converge Exchange, which are two organizations that she helped start um, that connected local communities to affordable housing professionals and activists. Um, but really, I guess she's more of a Chicagoan and uh, she has had a great impact on Chicago communities, um, which is what brought her firm to the attention of the Ralph Applebaum Associates and the Obama Presidential Center, which is pretty cool. Um, Monica Chata, AIA, is the founder and principal architect for, the, for Civic Projects Architecture and an adjunct professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology. She is a featured designer in the Say It Loud Illinois exhibit, who is focused on quality architecture for everyone. Though she is most notable for community engagement work, her actual work covers affordable housing, mixed use buildings, civic projects, and exhibition space, such as the design work she's currently working on for the Obama Presidential Center. Please chat welcome. Monica Chata. Couldn't resist. I love it. Um, well, Monica, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an absolute pleasure to have a chance to speak with everyone. Uh, we're always at a bit of a disadvantage on Zoom because I can't see everyone right this minute, but uh, I'm excited to share what I'm hoping we can do as I can talk and share a little bit about it the work that we do at Civic Projects. And then hopefully we have enough time to kind of actually have more of a dialogue and get a chance to sort of um, allow you time to ask questions and really talk about what we do as opposed to, you know, it being a one directional um, conversation. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. You'll just have to let me know if that looks fine in a second. There we go. Monica, are we good with? I see, very good, thank you. Perfect. Got it. Um, so I thought I would start with a fun slide is um, we are all a product of our influences and it's something Monica and I spoke a little bit about is just sort of maybe situating a little bit where we come from. So Civic Projects Architecture was founded in 2014, but my career is probably about 25, 30 years long. Um, and it's been influenced by a lot of num uh, numerous different things. I'm Canadian by birth. I went to a co-op program at the University of Waterloo and everything you're seeing is a dot on this map from Toronto to Vancouver to Ahmedabad to Chicago are places that I worked. And then I have projects where I've spent time in Rome and 
Mumbai and Detroit and Paris, either through projects or through fellowships and other opportunities. So I just think it's sort of important to realize we're kind of, we're some of our parts, we're sort of a, a combination. And one of the most influential moments that really informs why civic projects architecture was, was created is the work I did with, um, I had the opportunity to work with Balkrishna Doshi at the Vastu Shilpa Foundation in Ahmedabad in India. And uh, if anyone's recently seen some of his work um, posted or uh, seen his Pritzker Prize um, lecture, he is, um, his Vitra uh, design uh, retrospective calls him an architect for the people, right? And I think that, that I wanna to touch just a little bit on that because it has so much to do with um, early influences. I, I had my formal education as we would getting a bachelor's and eventually a master's in architecture. But my, my influences that created the career and the, the path that I took really came out a lot out of my work study and, and pursuit sort of beyond the, the four walls of the architectural studio. What happened in um, this past year, uh, in part due to the pandemic is the, the Balkrishna Doshi's exhibit came to Chicago, the, the Vitra um, exhibit came to Chicago to uh, Wrightwood Gallery, and there was there was a very difficult moment because you know we're in the middle of a pandemic where we have limited and restrictive roles that museums and exhibits and galleries are able to play, and we have this moment where we want to share this knowledge that is really an international based on an international audience and an international um, space. So what we ended up doing is we worked with, I, I had the chance, I, I spoke with Brad over at uh, Alphawood and, and Wrightwood and was like, well, how, how do we make this relevant, right? How do you, how do you talk about this architect for the people? Uh, someone who talks about design and design creating homes and homes being about people. How do you do that uh, of somebody really that people haven't heard of or aren't aware of the influences of his work? So what we did is we brought it to Chicago. In this photo, you're seeing Aisha Butler who is an activist in Englewood in one of the neighborhoods that I work in. And we walked the exhibit and we actually had this moment where when we were in Englewood walking through Englewood talking about the influences, the engagement, the social uh, work of Doshi's work, we had this moment where she's like, oh, I see how these influences of social housing and mixed use spaces and shared environments could actually be created in this neighborhood here in Chicago in Englewood. And so we created this dialogue and that's, that's kind of part of what our work's about, right? How do we create collaborations and dialogues between different environments? And similarly, uh, Edra Soto, who's an artist, a local artist in Chicago, um, we, did, we did the same. We did a series of three 15 minute clips, uh, videos, where we, we found the synergy. We found the synergy between these cultural influences um, and, and the kind of, the placeness of Chicago. And then Natalie Moore, some of you may know as a writer and author and talks about uh, Chicago as a segregated city, um, took us through Bronzeville and, and sort of similarly talked about how um, the, the social environment and the exchanges that we create in uh, Bronzeville, how they are both kind of different, similar or influenced by the kind of work that someone like uh, Doshi does. So, all that's a lot about, um, I guess, kind of mission-based work, right? If we're talking about engagement and social and, and we're talking about sort of how people work together, but the, the, the issue I had or the challenge I had, so I, I was really lucky. I had some really fantastic mentors, including uh, I worked at Studio Gang for three years with Jeannie Gang. I worked, spent five years with Ross Barney Architects with Carol Ross Barney. And so I had some really amazing leadership and, and a lot of female leadership uh, in my career path. And I felt that there was still a gap and a lack and the gap and the lack kind of came around sort of um, in housing came around equitable development, I would say ultimately, but, but came around the gap between who we're serving, how we're serving, what we're doing and, and what our role is as architects. So to me, I developed sort of the basis of our practice on the idea of we're gonna start with listening. So we're not gonna start knowing what the project is. Um, we're gonna spend extended periods of times in the communities, in the neighborhoods and with the organizations we work with. So I often say a project 
or a project relationship is a three to five year commitment to a neighborhood. Um, and then really talking about bringing everyone to the table, right? Everyone's an expert. We're not operating in a silo. So I don't want to come in with exclusively this role of I am the person who is going to design the space that you are in. I really want to come to the conversation and come to the environment where we can all talk about um, what works, what doesn't work, what we're passionate about, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, and use all of that to actually create a space, um, a, a, a space that every, you know, a space for everyone to feel comfortable in. And what we did, we, we created this diagram sometime back to try to talk a little bit about, um, we see sort of a typical project deadline, uh, timeline as kind of starting with pro programming concept and running through to construction administration. So really the, the schematic design, the design development, creating the construction documents, but sort of often people see architects as in this kind of blue box. And what we try to do is we really try to get ahead of that and follow beyond where we really talk, um, our projects tar start with pre-design, right? We, st we start where we're actually looking at what is the problem to be solved and who is involved in the conversation um, as opposed to starting with like, we already have a program or we already know what the product is gonna be. And um, a lot of our work is situated, uh, mo most of our work is situated in Chicago and a lot of our work is situated on the South side of Chicago. And what I thought I'd do is show a couple quick projects to give a little bit of a sense of where that, um, where this is, uh, where these, these how, how we evolve uh, these ideas. So Global Citizenship Experience Lab School is a nonprofit high school in Chicago that is moving to uh, downtown, uh, down, uh, downtown on State Street, not far from uh, Macy's. And what we did is we workshopped with the students. There had been robust programming and development of the proposal where students were actually involved in creating the request for proposal to involve architects in designing their space. Once ourselves, Architectures Fund and FAR Associates, so three design firms came on board, what we did is we did a series of workshops and engagement sessions where we talked about what an alternative high school could look like, right? And what did that, the idea of um, creative education, sustainable education, civic education, what could that look like? And one of the most resonating thoughts and conversations was about this idea of how do, what I, how do I take what I've learned here and bring it back to where I'm from? So we actually evolved the, the program of the facility around this idea of um, how, how do I learn, right? How do I have a center of learning? And then how do I push, push beyond those boundaries and share back to my community, share back to my neighborhood, share back to my city? You know, what's my civic impact? What's my global impact? Um, from the teaching and learning that I'm doing. And, and we used that process and that thinking in the entire development of the project. So it was kind of a really messy process because everybody was sort of involved in the conversations of what needed to happen and where the synergies were. And even the fact that we had, um, uh, you know, several architecture firms at the table um, resonated to that synergy and that collaboration. And uh, we, I think there's still draft on these because we, we're just finishing up some of the renderings for the new space. But, but what we heard and what we heard over and over was this idea of like small focused learning, areas where I can interact, where areas where I can exchange, areas where I can share out. So we started developing moments within what could be just a classic hallway or a classic corridor or a classic place to get from one classroom to another and started involving sort of moments of teaching or moments of learning, which, which you're seeing in this uh, slide. And then um, for those of you who are a little more familiar and, and sh with Chicago and Chicago South Side, we've got Washington Park and Jackson Park, which is where the Museum of Science and Industry lies. And then they're connected by the Midway with the University of Chicago, kind of the, the most prominent presence uh, b between the two parks. And uh, in in Jackson Park is the site of the future Obama Presidential Center. And um, that's a, a privilege uh, of a project to be working on. And we're specifically working with Ralph Applebaum and Associates on the museum component. Um, so the project, the Obama Center is, is made up of four buildings. Uh, the, the fourth building is being the tower and then the museum. 
is located within the tower. So everything that you see that's blue on this sectional slide speaks to areas that are about museum and exhibit. So Todd Williams and Billy Sien are the base building architects um, and, and then Ralph Applebaum and Associates are the, the prime museum exhibit designers and Van Valkenburg and Associates are the prime uh, landscape architects with an incredibly uh, diverse um, and integrated um, team. So there's, there's uh, we're working with um, site design, we're working with habitat, we're working with um, IDA architects, um, but but there's, you know, as you know, right, that the, the team is built from from the from all of its parts. Um, and our team, specifically at the initial stages of, of ideating with Ralph Applebaum and Associates, we, we brought together a number of collaborators and you can sort of see just even even seeing the the team here, right? Like nothing, nothing is uh, Nothing's made up of a singular person or a, an individual moment in time. And then um, something else I'd spoken about when we were developing the themes for this lecture was uh, talking about equitable development, but maybe talking about equitable development in terms of um, the idea of reinvest reinvestment. So one of the things um, that you will see in Chicago, you see this in Detroit, you see this in a lot of Midwest cities, is a lot of kind of building stock um, that is still intact, but vacant. Or you will see vacant lots between buildings, or you will see, so, so, so there's just sort of these, um, when I spent time in Detroit, you know, Detroit as a city was, had had loss, the loss of population, the loss of building stock, um, you know, gaps, gaps in communities and neighborhoods. And then Chicago has that at the scale of neighborhoods. So when you're in individual neighborhoods, you will see all, almost all of the same characteristics, loss of building stock, vacancy, empty buildings, um, that, that, that are, and, and it's different, right? It's different as you move through different neighborhoods. So, um, this is kind of, you know, perhaps a view that you, this is from Bronzeville looking from, uh, you can see the green line to your slide right, um, but you're looking to downtown from the south side. And the, the building where our office is was actually a former parking garage. You used to not be able to park on the streets. And uh, artist, um, an artist organization in a, a a, um, a nonprofit worked together to repurpose this uh, vacant garage. In 2001, there was a fire and this slide is where you see what was left. So you really had four walls. Um, and over the next three years, the um, founders worked to build experimental station or rebuild experimental station, establish a nonprofit and develop this this building out of this parking garage that became a coffee shop, a bike shop, Invisible Institute, which is an investigative uh, independent reporting agency, City Bureau that works with uh, reporting in different neighborhoods, Southside Weekly. So you had all of these nonprofits that were able to sort of be housed in this building run by Experimental Station that does everything from um, food, uh, 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 fresh food markets, uh, to working with arts organizations, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so you've got this, this hub, right? This community hub coming out of this repurposed building. And we were co-sharing in this space and then had this moment where I was talking to Connie and it's like, I'm like, we're growing, you know, exciting moment in architecture. We're growing, we're expanding, we're, we're building you know, uh, there's not enough space for us to co-share. And she took me over to this corner of the building and was like, what about this? You know, can you do something with this? Um, we're architects, of course we could do something with this. We got incredibly excited and, and, and worked with Experimental Station to sort of design and create our space in this kind of hub, this community hub. And so we're in Woodlawn, um, within the map I was showing, we're actually walking distance to the Obama Presidential uh, Center site where the other side of the, the Metro tracks. And then the, the, the other part of our work, and so I'm, I 
I'm, de I'm de I deliberately sort of picked four snippets, but one sort of entire anchor in our work is not just in the reinvestment and um, rebuilding literally of, of um, the housing stock, it's actually all components of it. So it includes the development, it includes the property management, it includes the construction. So what we're doing with all of our mixed use residential, in most cases, we actually own, we're not a design build firm. We've, we've uh, been clearly made a decision not to be a design build firm, but we actually develop and GC and run affordable housing in the neighborhoods where we also do the architecture and design work for a number of community organizations and uh, local stakeholders and entrepreneurs. So I, I pulled one example, which is, um, we call the project Cheerful Credit. Uh, Cheerful Credit, you'll see in a second, is on the on the sign that is that is facing us. Um, but Cheerful Credit is is an incredibly robust commercial corridor, three um, commercial storefronts, ten apartment unit uh, building that um, you could describe as maybe Bronzeville at grade, so sort of Southside Chicago at grade and rural Alabama on top. This was a building that had just been left. The, 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 the owners of the furniture shop ran the furniture shop and, and people lived upstairs, but nobody really went upstairs to maintain or care for or provide quality housing stock uh, in an area which obviously could benefit from that. Any area can benefit from quality housing stock. So thus, this was an example of where a building had fallen into disrepair. So cheerful credit, which you can now see why we call it that, um, is, is that, um, um, is, is aimed to build the quality of affordable housing. So not just the quality of housing that's available within a neighborhood, but the quality of affordable housing that's available within that neighborhood. And, um, You'll, you can, th this is just sort of a quick floor plan showing uh, what we did is we, we've gutted everything. You'll see a photo in a second, but what we've done is created a series of three bedroom units. So we've created sort of a great room, which is sort of your living kitchen. And then every unit, all 10 units have three bedrooms. Um, this and, and washer dryers in the units, um, individual heat, uh, all of these kinds of elements. And the reason I'm saying that is that um, we can, the, the three bedroom units in Bronzeville can accommodate um, larger families um, just in terms of demand. Uh, sometimes new housing stock doesn't have as much diversity of, um, uh, uh, as much diversity in number of units, right? There, there's always the metrics, right? How many studios, how many one bedrooms, how many two bedrooms, how many three bedrooms? And because of the size of these units, we were able to create three bedroom units. And we really went in, I, I, I realized I should probably have a photo of, of what it was like before the gutting, but we, we went in and gutted everything um, and really sort of built the, the building back up from, from scratch. David Shalyol is an amazing photographer. Uh, he used to live in Chicago and, and had taken photos of the building, which is, which is why you're seeing several of these exterior views. But one of the many things we uncovered actually was something called ghost signs. Um, so again, because you're kind of peeling away at a building and peeling away at, at the, 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 the just, just peeling away at the layers and layers. So actually when we got under the plaster, we realized we'd already suspected this, but we realized that the wall, the, the, the two, um, the North and South walls had actually been exterior walls in a previous life. So they had the old sign, they had old painted signs on, um, on, on the brick facade. So we've actually um, exposed and revealed all this. So this is a 15 and a half, 16 foot high ceilinged painted brick wall bedroom uh, that is in one of the units. And then in that same vein, there was a series of built-in furniture pieces that what we've done is actually pulled them out, um, cleaned them up, and then actually returned them to their location and kind of are now kind of revealing and celebrating um, 
the the um, the pieces, and and the reason I'm showing those, and then um, we've we've proposed that the adjacent property uh, become a new construction, but the reason I'm showing sort of this and these kinds of images is I think there's a care and a quality and a um, a, a, a a pride of place and space that we all want. We're in we're in the environments that we live in, and we take a lot of pride in providing that for all of our clients and not um, not trying to make a distinction. Um, and and the reason I say that is it's just you're seeing sort of the, these are going to be um, affordable rental units in Bronzeville. And then the second project, much later, this is actually a, a single family project on the north side residential project, but it it has a different attention to detail, but it also has an attention to detail and care and finishes. So the, 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 the reason I show both of these projects in parallel is that we're trying to create what I would term as quality housing and accessible housing in multiple neighborhoods for multiple environments and not trying to create a dichotomy between sort of this is in one part of the city and then, you know, I'm going back and forth, but sort of this is another part of the city. So at, at one um, at, at one level, right, the the cost of a full single family gut rehab for that construction cost, we're actually gutting and rehabbing ten apartment units. So there there is a difference, but the qualities of spaces that we're creating and the environment that we're creating we're 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 holding a parallel we're trying to hold a line to that and then i think the last um the last i'm not even going to talk about this as a project but it was something that resonated when monica asked me to speak is uh the social justice component so we talk about community and equitable development. And we talk about social justice all as components of sort of the work we do. And we did a workshop with um, survivors of police torture. Um, Chicago is the only city in the States who has acknowledged that there was uh, torture by the police department under their watch. And one of the things that one of the survivors, Mark Clement sent to us is the integrity of justice looks like us. We give it identity and without us, there is no picture. And I, I, this is this is a quote directly from Mark Clements, but I really um, credit um, him with kind of making us think a little bit more about the profession. The the statement "Without us, there is no picture," um, I think, really reflects on why we design and why we create the spaces that we do. Right? With with without the person who lives in the house, without the stakeholder, without the user, without the neighbor going to the grocery store, right? Like whoever inhabits the spaces we design without the people who inhabit the spaces we design, there, there's, there is no picture, right? There's no space because there's nobody inhabiting that space. Um, and this, I, I think I'll, I'll gloss over this, but this was a memorial project that we did that connected to the, um, to the Torture Justice Center, but it was, it was, it was work that came out of this um, dialogue and quote that we had with, with Mark Clements about um, seeing each person as an individual. And in, in the case, in this, in this example, the case of a memorial, actually identifying each individual person and recognizing each individual person's life um, as opposed to um, having a uniform um, moment. So we were individual, this project was seeking to individualize 120 um, survivors of police torture, uh, police victimization in Chicago. Um, which I just realized is probably not the cheeriest project to end on, um, but it is kind of where I would like to sort of pause and stop. And I'm happy to talk more about our work, but I think that I'm hoping this just sort of kind of gave us a baseline for a little bit of a conversation. Um, so Monica, I think I'm just going to open it back up unless uh, there's a specific question, maybe see if we have a dialogue. Yeah, um, we did get uh, got a couple of questions in here from um, a fellow Chicagoan who is here in Las Vegas. Um, 
does your group collaborate with Chicago Housing Authority? And if yes, what's their role? We do. I would say we don't, I, I don't know if I would call it a collaboration exactly, but what when I talk about affordable rental, what I'm talking about is vulture uh, rental housing. So we are actually designing and creating spaces that are then uh, leased or rented out to Chicago Housing Authority Section 8 voucher holders. So it's the it's the private side of the CSA housing. Let me see if I got this right. Are your are your projects do your projects have to do with, see, are your projects have to do with the reinvestment and replacements of Cabri Green and Robert Taylor housing units? So, um, the, the geography of the project I was just showing, am I getting a bit of an echo, is that me? It's just you, I don't hear it. Okay, the um, Chicago, um, the Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor Homes are, are both um, former or still CHA sites, but CHA sites uh, where um, the the all of the public housing was demolished and they replaced it with mixed income housing in 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 Cabrini Green uh, being on the north side's case, uh, most of the housing stock has been returned as mixed income and Robert Taylor Homes are still um, a fair amount of vacant land. We are in proximity to the Robert Taylor homes, but we're not on CHA property. So the I showed one multifamily uh, property, but we're looking at, we've probably rehabbed probably eight to 10 different sort of six flat to 10 unit buildings that are, you know, in, in a four mile geography uh, proximity to Robert Taylor. Uh, clearly whoever asked that question knows their Chicago geography. Sorry, I was just uh, trying to look at what we had over here. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't think, I don't know that you cover this. So I, so something I asked you um, in one of the emails was um, uh, for these projects that you're developing, um, that you're developing and designing and then um, managing afterwards, um, what's what's a comparable rent like in those neighborhoods? Because uh, I know that you're trying to just do you're trying to do infill, so you have affordable housing in a variety of neighborhoods. But um, you know, are you tracking like the difference in um, in those rental rates for those for those areas versus what you're what you're supplying? Does that make sense? You with me? Yeah, yeah no, it makes, makes sense. sense. So we actually set our rents based on the Section 8 uh, CHA voucher program. So we have, so um, CHA actually inspects the units and mostly based on geography and square footage identifies the rental price for that. So a, a three bedroom, um, a three bedroom in several of the six flats we've done probably runs for about uh, 1,350 dollars a month is about what it's renting at. Um, I think the units I'm showing, I showed in this uh, presentation might come a little, high, like maybe they'll come around 1450 because there's washer dryer and it's it's individualized heat, not not boilers. And, and there, there's a couple of sort of specific amenities that, that may change that formula a little bit. Um, but the thing I think you're getting at, Monica, is is something that we have been tracking and, and is, is why I talk about equitable development is, we're, this is all privately funded. This is all, this is, frankly, it's it's our money. Uh, we, we, we're not even working with investors right now. And the reason I say that is because then it means we're actually probably very competitively designing and very competitively looking at how we're constructing, what our materials are, et cetera, et cetera, right? The, the cost is important. And we're able to, I would say probably do these units I'm going to I'm going to go on the higher side, but let's let's say about one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. We can do the cost of renovation. Um, the a similar unit in a, a tax credit project, like a one or two bedroom unit in a tax credit project might be 
the cost of construction might be about 350,000, possibly up to $400,000. So I think that's when we, it, it's not even just the rental price, it's the cost that it's taking to turn these buildings into productive use. Ah, for a second there, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think I think that is um, that's always a little bit of a problem for uh, trying to develop affordable housing is where all that cost comes together and how that um, and what impact that has on the actual buildings. Anyone else have anyone else have questions, or I'm just going to keep going. I have a question, Monica, um, for you. As this is the women in architecture committee that's putting on this um, on this program today. I, I'm going to kind of go in that vein a little bit and ask um, two questions. Um, do you find uh, any challenges being a woman working in these community type of projects where you're working with the community members very closely? And second question is, do you see a difference in um, the number of uh, women versus men going into these type of community projects in their career? Is there a, is there a difference in your office? Do you get more, um, more applicants that are female or male knowing the kind of work that you do? So I'll, I'll try to break that down a little because there's a couple of really good questions in there. Um, I do think, I know for myself, I have a strong commitment to the type of work we do. And um, some of that may be sort of more gender personality based um, than just being what we learned kind of in the throes of being in architecture school. Um, what I will say is that our dynamic and the environment and the way we interact is definitely uh, influenced by who we are quite literally. I'm very excited to say we're an all female office right now, uh, which is, um, I believe if we look at statistics and numbers, we're actually a majority minority female office. And um, that I don't see as much. Um, and I think that does influence our work in terms of, I do think it helps, um, I, I don't, I'm not a hardliner when I go for projects, right? I'm not like a, it, 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 I, I honestly, when I'm working with clients and, and kind of when we're meeting entrepreneurs or new businesses or new organizations, we're building a relationship more than vying for a job. So I think that's something that I would, I would contend is probably a little bit different. Uh, that approach is a little bit different, maybe uh, being a, a, a female led office um, because I want to build the relationship with the client and then through that relationship, build good architecture. Um, a lot of our work, we're not necessarily competing for per se, right? We're building the relationship and then projects are coming out of those relationships. Um, how did you become uh, involved in local community projects? Like, when did that all start? How did you jump into that? So I started in undergrad where I, there was a case study for a project, literally like it was a case study in a precedent where um, a homeless shelter was in part, uh, this was in Toronto, the SRO, um, was in part kind of completed program designed by people who lived there. And I didn't realize when I discovered this project that like, or when I learned more about the project that this was not the norm, right? To me, it was like an amazing precedent. And then I sought out working in Doshi's office. I, I don't think I did a good job of contextualizing why I went there, but um, I had had a very, Western focused traditional architectural training. And uh, frankly, what I, when I started looking at what other people were doing in other countries, I felt that that was where there was a gap, 
um, I didn't feel like there was enough of a people aspect to the work I was doing in school, but I didn't really know what that meant either. So I sought out going to India, which is where my family's, uh, my, my family roots are. And I sought out specifically working in Doshi's office. So I spent four months in Doshi's office where we talked about low income communities and creating rental units within a house. So you could have a house with a flex unit and that flex unit within the house could be a bedroom for an aging family member or could be your storefront or could be a rental unit for a single person who worked down the street, right? Like there, there were all these models of kind of integrated housing and ways to make housing affordable and create more diverse communities that were embedded in the work that I got to study and got to experience when I was there. And I very proudly brought that back, right? Like I, I'm like, this is amazing. This is beautiful. This is what architects should be doing. Um, so I put that all in my, my studio project immediately following because it was a co-op program. And I, I, you know, beautifully present this like, here's my half done architecture because the people who live here are going to build the rest of it, right? So I, I was basically fundamentally doing what I thought was exactly what we should do, but fundamentally also saying, hey, I'm an architect who's not going to design it all. Um, I had the choice between an F or redoing the project. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how I started getting into something that I'm now making a career out of. Um, and Oh, good. Go, Alexia. I have a question. Kind of a different take on what Anna asked you earlier. I was wondering if there's any advantages that you saw in being a woman or women in your office working in community projects. Does it give you a, allow you different access to people, you know, in, in a way you talk about listening and building relationship. Uh, do you connect with people differently? Do you see that as potentially different? And is there anything that our male counterparts could perhaps learn from? I like the way you asked that. Um, I think it's different. I think we do approach it differently. I think we approach it differently because we're more tactile about it. Um, when we when we have dialogues or engagement, um, like like when when we're trying to do the the sharing, right, the shared stories or the shared experience or lived experiences, as part of going through a design process, I do think the fact that we're more tactile allows us more access to that conversation. So I'm I when I um, when I ask about your lived experience to better understand how to create another space. I really want to hear about that lived experience and I want to integrate that into the design. Um, not to sound sexist, but this is going to sound sexist. I feel like that doesn't always happen. I, I think if, 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 uh, if the genders were reversed, I think the approach to that would be different. I think it would be a little more, um, a little more rigid in terms of more um, data oriented. Right. And, and I, I am being, a little bit stereotypical when I say that, but I, I don't I don't lead with the data usually when I do my projects, right? I usually lead with the softer content and we build the data around it. I mean, we're, we're in everything from, you know, GIS to like, we have uh, interns from the University of Chicago who are doing research on the work we, on, on equitable development and the neighborhood work that we're doing. So we, we don't lack the rigor, but I think we sort of, we, we come in from the, the more tactile and more, more um, yeah, just the much more sort of tactile and sense, uh, uh, I wanna use the word sensual, I don't know if it's quite the right word here, but just a much more tactile approach. But, but then, but, but it's still built from all the, you know, it, it, the data doesn't get lost, right? The rigor doesn't get lost. Right, but I think that's just inherent in um, who we are. So um, it's 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 no um, it's not against men. Men do things totally differently, than, not totally, but a lot differently than we do. And it's a good add plus, right? Uh, or a good add subtract. A good a good both and. Um, yeah. I, I do think that the dynamic we're building in the office right now is pretty spectacular, and I think it's a combination of 
very talented people, but I also think that there is, um, I do think there's less competitiveness within the office right now. I feel, I feel that it's definitely a shared, um, it's a shared environment. Uh, we've, we've recently just brought on a new um, staff member and um, I, I see other people in the office responding to her excitement with excitement, right? It's like, you're on board, great, let's problem solve this, great, let's do the next thing. So it's just like, it, it, there's a, we're all in it together feeling that I have right now in the office that I think has evolved over time as we grow. Can you talk a little bit maybe about how your office ended up being this way? <laughs> Apparently, I don't know if you, you know, specifically sought um, the talents or people were attracted to you and just ended up being an all women office now. It's not by accident, but we do not discriminate when we hire. So be, it, it is all talent based. Um, I think Monica, you started to ask this earlier, or and I'm not sure uh, about who's maybe attracted to the office. And I think that's a mix, but I would say I probably get more inquiries from from young women, particularly if um, like because I teach and I a lecture um, often after a lecture or after I've been to a school or university, I will get some direct inquiries or contacts and those are almost always from women in the audience. Um, I do hear, I, I've heard this several times, but where it's like, it, it's a little bit of the like, hey, you're someone who looks like me and you're doing this. How do I learn to do this too? Um, I don't think I realized how much that was lacking in my, in my kind of educational growth, but I know that once I got into the profession, I sought it out. Like it was very conscious for me to apply to firms that were led by women. And it was an experience I wanted to go. So I, I worked primarily with either women led or minority owned firms as I got to the point that I could build a practice. Carlos, oh, there he goes. That's who I was looking for. Yeah. Hey, Monica, actually, I, I wanted to ask you, and I think this is really important. We are really focused on diversity, and I know this is Women's History Month, but you are, your identity is multi-sectional, right? You are a woman of color, you're a woman in general, uh, but can you talk about the intersectionality that, that you've experienced in being able to really improve the field, you know? AIA in general is an organization that wants to really embody diversity and, and you have cross-sectionality in a lot of different things. How has that helped impact the work that you do, especially uh, when it comes to working with communities of color, uh, other women, et cetera? So, I, you know, I'm always challenged by this because sometimes I want to be like, oh, it's not like, there are moments that you wanna be, we're all on the same playing field kind of moment, right? Like, like we're, you know, I, I, you hire me because I'm an architect, you don't hire me because I'm a female architect, right? Like, we're, like we've all had this moment of that conversation. But when you flip it around, right? I, I think when you combine being female and being um, a minority, it does change because I work in, um, a lot of mixed communities and a lot of primarily African-American communities. And I'm not the white person walking into the room, right? Like I'm, 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 I, I, I clearly have some identity, identity, identity relationship. I don't know if that's quite the right combination of words, but there, there is, um, I'm not the, I don't come across as the outsider coming in to save the day, right? I don't come in as the outsider who thinks they know everything and is going to answer the problem. And it's a very, cause I don't wanna be that, right? There's no desire to be that, but being female and being a minority, I think helps make it believable, right? Like I can say it, but I, I'll demonstrate it. But in demonstrating it, the fact that, cause I'm first generation, um, 
there's just, there's a lot of affinity groups. I mean, Carlos, you sort of alluded to it, right? I, I cross a lot of these, the, the, what could be a very sharp line, I kind of live between that line. And I think it's the fact that I live between that line is what makes those conversations um, more open, which then leads to sort of a better design project. I really appreciate you sharing that, Monica. Um, I, I, of course, do not come from an architectural background, but I think the diversity really plays a role in, in what it is that architects are trying to accomplish, especially within the AIA, being an organization that takes diversity as a cornerstone of, of what we'd like to accomplish in the future. And in so many of the things and the policies that, that are the ones that AIA um, protects and are wanting to be stakeholders in. So thank you for your answer. I have an, another question, um, kind of on the flip side of that. So you've got, um, you, you've got these, these things that you identify with, uh, the woman, the, the person of color, the architect, um, all these different pieces to, to your personality and your character. Do you find that that affects the way you approach conversations with, um, with people of color or of a different sex? Do you find yourself walking into a room, say, that is um, predominantly female versus predominantly male, would you address it differently? Is there certain techniques that you would use if you were talking to one audience versus another, say? So it's kind of funny. I, 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 Monica and I talked a little bit about this. Um, I think the other day, and I, part of me was really tempted to be like, "No, you know, it, it's all, it's the same, right? Like you can work, walk, walk into different environments and be the same." And then I've had the last two days of um, working with. Um, uh, from the client side, there's a series of experts. And then from our side, there's a series of experts on a particular project I'm working on. And one of the, I guess technical experts is probably the official term, but one of the technical experts who is male um, has been coaching me or um, advising me or, or sort of, and, and in some ways very appropriately, right? Like. Um, this person's expertise is different than my expertise and there's things I can learn and things that can improve the project. Awesome. But then I had this particular conversation about um, a little more along the lines of, oh, I don't want to micromanage, but here's how I would do this. Or I don't want this, but here's how I would do this. And I found myself, and, and, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to the, the person, but I found myself, I had a moment where I was like, Am I having this conversation because I'm getting fantastic advice on improving the project? Or am I having this conversation because I'm a female in the room and it was a male who was speaking to me? And I unfortunately, I can't answer that question, right? I, I, I genuinely, I think the person was truly being helpful. I don't question that. But I, I, I and I spoke to one of my colleagues and we both had this moment of like, if we had both been male in that presentation, would we have been addressed the same way? And I, I'm not sure that we would have. I think we would have been addressed differently. But flip, flip, flipping that, do you address people differently? Even if it's unconsciously. I know I, in, in, in my work as well, try to, to kind of see if I'm, if I walk into a construction site and I'm dealing with a, a, a male general contractor versus a a female general contractor, I would like to think that I would approach it both the same way. <laughs> but subconsciously, I, I, I think it's a little different. So I, I was wondering if you have any experience like that. I, I, when you describe it that way, I'm like, I think I, I'd have to completely agree with you. I think I do approach it differently. I think that um, sometimes when a client is female or a GC, it's less, very infrequent that the GC I'm working with is female, but um, 
with a group of stakeholders, particularly leadership on the client side, when I'm walking into a room and if I'm dealing, um, it, it's a little more casual or a little more social and maybe that's not good or maybe that is good, right? But there's, um, I will tend to try to find a connection moment as opposed to just be very um, strategic and tactical about it. So um, like, I, I had an interview recently. Um, so there was one woman and two men from the client side interviewing us. And my correspondence had been with, with, with one of the men, but I knew when I was having the interview and being asked questions, I, there were certain questions I was answering specifically to the woman of the three people that were interviewing me, right? Like I, I, I can absolutely thinking the way you're describing that example, it's like, I wanted to create a relationship and an affinity with the client who was female and then more so with the client who is male i wanted to be like yes i can do the job and here's how i would do it and here are the things i would do it so in one case i was trying to maybe create a little more friendship in one case i was maybe more creating the business relationship so yeah i'm good or bad i think i do approach it differently yeah, i can i i can I see that, that in my in my way um, um, it's, it's more, more like, like performing, performing sometimes, sometimes and yes. versus relationship building. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have, uh, we have another question from Lance. Uh, can you talk more about working outside of the traditional boundaries of architectural design, like the SD to CA, that blue area that you identified on your slide and then how that affects building relationships, working in, oh, and how this affects building relationships when you're working in communities. Well, I well, think that's, that's why, why we made that diagram. That. Um, if, if you're spending three to five years working within a community or with an organization, and you're starting at kind of the, the inception, right, at the very beginning, um, you've built a completely different relationship. Um, the The... Chicago Torture Justice uh, Center client that I mentioned at the end, we've been um, the original executive director started with the organization forming and two weeks later we started working with the Torture Justice Center on strategic planning and some visioning and, and some work. Um, it is now three and a half years later and we're only just starting to embark on what might be like what we would consider traditional architecture. So we have um, supported grant writing. We have supported um, some of the visioning sessions. We have worked, we've done resilience building community workshops, um, which has been like literally community workshops where you're doing like photo essays in the community and having the dialogues and telling the stories that go with it and generating a website, generating a, a, a gallery show. And um, so I, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, but those are all the things that are happening long before we get into that blue box, right? That those are that almost all of my relationship with that client, I think, you know, maybe next week when I actually start looking at the potential lease space, we will start entering the blue box and say, okay, what's the program? What's the cost of construction going to be? How do we get there? But how I design that and how I lay that out and how I share that with the client is completely informed by the last three and a half years, right? They, they, I, we almost don't have to spend any time getting to know each other at this point. And, and we can say, hey, I want a space where three people can work. And I know, well, based on your mission, this is gonna be a collaborative space. It's gonna need this. It needs a level of privacy because a survivor may come and need counseling. It needs this, it needs this. Like, I don't have to have um, a bunch of programming sessions. I just need to have maybe like a singular conversation that's gonna then take all of, all of what we've already done together and synthesize it into what, for now will be leased space and eventually it'll be a new building. Is that what you were looking for, Lance? Yeah, I thought that was just interesting only because it takes a lot just to get to the design process. You know, we, we also have um, projects that we're working on that um, there's no design yet. It's just all a lot of talk at this point and a lot of research. 
So I totally get that. Let's see. Did you say something? Yep. We're all good. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? This is the fun part of Zoom, right? It's like, does somebody want to type in another question or? Um, uh, right, either that or we'll unmute you. You know, one of the things uh, I'd asked you a couple days ago was, you know, about your transition when you were going from working, you know, because you you work you went specifically to other firms uh, to learn about um, the kinds of things they were doing or like how you eventually um, started your own firm. But did you think that transition was difficult going from um, working for different kinds of people to running your own firm and having to do all of these things and making all those contacts again, or because you work for those other firms, you already had some of those contacts, especially for like um, uh, working in the community realm. There was a lot of relationship building for a lot of years. Um, I had in the time I started teaching at IIT in 2007. And at that time I was still at Ross Barney and continued to teach. There's a reason I'm saying this, continued to teach at IIT through both Ross Barney Studio Gang. And then I, I, did, I, I did some more work at Ross Barney. And the reason I'm saying that is that it was partly through the teaching actually that some of the relationships got built because of, you know, IITs at 35th and State uh, in the Bronzeville community. So some of the work I was doing with students was also community and socially engaged based. And so we were, we were, we were building relationships in the immediate vicinity of the school. And those relationships started, you know, six, eight, nine years before I ever got to forming a practice. Um, so I'd say I was a little less so building them necessarily directly within the practices I was working for, but it was all of the stuff that was being built around it. That's when um, we were doing structures for inclusion and ACD, Monica, that you mentioned. And I spent, when I left Studio Gang, I actually spent two years working, um, not moving to Detroit, but working in Detroit. So I spent two years working with the Detroit Collaborative Design Center on, and what I described it as, because people couldn't understand why I was leaving Studio Gang to go take, to go work part-time in Detroit, right? Like that was, that was considered very unusual. Um, and this was around the time of Detroit going bankrupt. So a very different Detroit than we know now. So what I did, what I told people is I was incubating right? I, I was actually incubating in Detroit to learn from some amazing precedents and amazing people that were already doing the kind of work I thought was relevant. So I incubated in Detroit and then was able to bring that back to Chicago. I actually think that's really good for uh, some of our younger members um, who are trying to figure out where they're going for the rest of their lives. Thanks for that. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I think um, you know we can we can wrap it up. Yeah, wrap I think up. I think Sounds that's all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Cool. So thank you very much, Monica. Um, I'm going to put this our our screen, our screen back, back up. up. Uh, just uh, just want to thank, thank uh, Monica Chatter for tonight's nice nice presentation, as well as Monica, Monica Anna, Anna, and. Uh, uh, Alexia. Um, as you can see now, we have our executive director, Carlos's email on the screen. So if there's anyone has any additional questions, uh, feel free to email Carlos. Um, also, if you're interested in joining Women in Architecture Committee, please feel free to reach out to Carlos. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it is not a committee just for women. Um, it is involved for all members. And we look forward to everyone uh, getting involved and attending. So again, I want to thank everyone for their attendance tonight. Uh, next month's presentation will be in collaboration with COAT, which is our Committee on the Environment. And that will take place on April 21st at 5.30 p.m. 
Uh, please look out for the formal announcement uh, from our speaker and our topic coming out in the next few days or so. Thank you, and everyone have a great evening. Bye. Bye.